I have an opportunity to introduce the next speaker. He really doesn't need much of an introduction to this crowd. <laughs> Many of you know him by his Twitter handle, I P V 6. And that was the P. Is there, is there, is there, is there, is there <laughs> That's the PG version, Stan. That's what I was required to do here. Shannon is a distinguished engineer, which is no easy task at Cisco. It is really a grueling process to achieve that level. And along the way, <laughs> I was promised I wouldn't do a roast, but look at the audience. Look at the audience. Many of you may have seen some of his publications over the years. In fact, we were talking about one of his white papers that still lives on today uh, relative to NAT64. The Cisco validated designs that are still valid today, Shannon was the primary author of. He took a lot of that experience and wrote the Cisco Press IPv6 Enterprise design book. So many of you may have that on your shelves as well. I've hinted to him that the second version is probably necessary, and he's looked at me as if there was a mirror in front of him. <laughs> no, no. Shannon has continued to diversify his experience. He's been focused on OpenStack, cloud, container networking over the last few years. And fortunately for us, he's going to regale us with some of that technical knowledge. I give you Shannon McFarland. I couldn't sleep last night because of the fear of what might come out of Tim Martin's mouth today in that introduction. So it was. So I, I paid the lunch crew to put melatonin in all of the food so that you'll be, you'll be asleep about uh, two slides into this. So I appreciate the, the opportunity to be here. Uh, so I started in uh, working with uh, uh, IPv6 uh, roughly 2002 um, and kind of uh, started driving more towards uh, less from a, an RFC and a standards perspective and more how people use things. And, and I spent my entire career on design and deployment. So I don't care why you're going to use IPv6. Um, I care about how you deploy it once you make that decision to do it. And so part of that uh, history uh, kind of rolls into my current uh, role uh, from the office of the CTO in the cloud uh, group at uh, Cisco on how we integrate advanced technologies together uh, in, in a variety of use cases. And so that's, uh, that's the topic we have today. So uh, back in 2002, I, I kind of coined this phrase, dual stack where you can, tunnel where you must, and use translation when you're on crack. Um, because back then, um, it, the purest mentality ruled, right? Uh, thou shalt never translate. Um, you know, that's the problem that we had. Uh, great talk today about uh, carrier grade NAT. Uh, we wanted pure IPv6 functionality. We did not want things in the way that would inhibit us. And we certainly did not want things that would continue um, propagating the IPv4 mentality of all things should be translated. Um, so that has kind of matured. Uh, I've kind of modified my belief system uh, that it's now IPv6 only where you can, dual stack where you must, um, and tunneling ends up not being too bad. Um, why? Because we live, especially in the world of cloud, we live with overlays. Uh, I actually have a t-shirt from, uh, from Dino who first did the IETF pitch on Lisp. Uh, and he handed the shirt out to the crowd and it said overlays are the only way. Um, so that seems to be what we do in the cloud a lot is we do isolation between tenants utilizing overlays with technologies such as VXLAN. Um, and some of this stuff is actually advantageous to us when we're trying to implement IPv6 in non-IPv6 native frameworks uh, within that cloud environment. Translation, though, is still an addiction. Um, and I don't think I've, I've really witnessed many uh, uh, discussions here this week that do not include translation as a part of their strategy. It's either a, a, uh, a stateful NAT64 model to, to submit 
uh, functionality on the north side of an application towards a client to be v6, but the back end is still v4. Um, and we're, we're also starting to see a trickle of uh, NPT or network prefix translation with IPv6 and, and staying within the same address family, uh, but, but managing NAT between two prefixes. And we'll talk a little bit about that in the cloud space. Um, so this is, this is probably going to mature and become uh, a, a slightly different view of the world as, as it has been since 2002. Uh, but this is kind of what I'm seeing uh, in implementation so far. Also, when you work for a vendor, you generally get vendor questions. Um, I am not in sales, I am not in marketing, and I don't own any products. So if you have a problem with a product, um, later at the microphone about uh, bitching and moaning about a router or a switch or a firewall, I don't know anything about them. Uh, to me, everything is free, and someone else owns the product. So I work purely on technology, um, and uh, in the last few years, I work uh, primarily only in open source, and so that's the perfect place to be as a vendor. You don't earn the company any money, but you spend a lot of it, so it's a, it's a good place to be. <laughs> So here's a, a high level view of our uh, agenda. We're gonna touch on just some very high level general cloud uh, fundamentals. Uh, a lot of these things are gonna make complete sense to you, but some of them are very frightening when we move into uh, the cloud space, especially when you start looking at building cloud native applications in a cloud environment, but trying to do V6 things with them. Um, we'll do a quick state of the union of, of the big three. I'm not going into all of the you know, the dream host and the rack space and the soft layer, and there's many, many out there that have pretty good stories. Uh, we're gonna talk uh, primarily about the, the big three and then look at some uh, private cloud and some container-oriented uh, status of things. And then we're gonna jump into an example of what you should be considering from an IPv6 perspective when you start looking at any cloud framework. And we're going to use one specific cloud um, technology stack out there uh, to kind of reinforce some of these fundamentals that you'll need no matter what uh, a brand of, of stack you use, and then we'll wrap it up. So some of the top concerns that we have in the cloud space is that we've got the bean counters, right? The execs that go uh, attend these wonderful conferences and they talk about um, this, this term called cost exchange, um, where I can very easily manage people out of my organization through layoffs, uh, but it's very, very difficult for me to manage out hardware that's on a three to five year depreciation window. Um, so uh, it's a lot easier for me to move things from physical assets in my data center out to cloud and then uh, uh, close the gap up of managing that through human, uh, through human uh, and automation uh, tool sets. Um, and when it comes time for me to retract from a budgetary or a business uh, change, it's a lot easier for me to continue with the automation that the humans built, but get rid of the humans. Um, and this is a very harsh reality that we all have to deal with when we're looking in the cloud. The problem we have from the IT side of the world is that we still have to do business as usual. Uh, we have to not really care about what the bean counters are doing, and we have to care more about maintaining uh, operational consistency within the business. Um, so in the context of the cloud, this brings up a list of things that we need to care about. So as it relates to continuing to do business, but doing it in the cloud, um, we've got to often deal with NAT, just like we're doing with V4. Many of the public cloud providers um, are working under a NAT model, whether it's a V6 to V4 translation uh, perimeter or a V6 to V6, and we'll talk more about that. Um, also, we also have some unnatural application flows in the cloud when V6 is involved. We'll talk about this in a few slides, but one of the issues is that a lot of the cloud providers are actually uh, heavy loading up their V6 functionality around the, the context of a load balancer. Um, so if your application doesn't cleanly talk to other things inside of the cloud, um, without a load balancer, you're gonna have some problems because some of the cloud providers actually mandate that V6 to V6 communication within that cloud is being done through a load balancer. Um, we'll also, in part of our live demonstration, I think I'm the only stupid person here to, uh, to actually do a live demo, so, so we'll see how that goes. But we're actually going to illustrate some of the challenges that we've got to deal with when we're looking at things that aren't an inherent core component of your cloud, but they do make your movement to the cloud or within the cloud um, easier. And that's things around orchestration and automation. We've got to make sure that those same toolkits that we're using uh, within our environments today can also support V6. And then we'll, we'll kind of drill down on some of these other bullet points. 
So uh, I've kind of started out in kind of a, a harsh and, and kind of a sad and pathetic tone to this talk. Uh, but the good news is, is that from a data center perspective, nearly every vendor out there is getting stronger and stronger on their stories um, as it relates to uh, IPv6 performance, quality of service, multicast, security, many of those things that we take for granted in the V4 world have been sadly missing in the IPv6 space and each of the vendors are getting better in that space. Also, we're starting to see quite a bit of more robust support within uh, the various cloud offerings out there and we'll definitely spend some time on that. So this slide is kind of a repeat of what many people have talked about uh, already, right? So we've got these drivers to people to, to do things from a V4 to V6 perspective. Um, at the exact same time, we're experiencing the movement of uh, multiple different paradigm shifts within IT. We are starting to see um, this buzzword of DevOps, and we're starting to see uh, this movement out to cloud, and in many cases, coming back from cloud um, and having to now manage a hybrid cloud of environments. Uh, and, and I say it environments uh, because many, many customers have multiple sites. They use multiple different providers for multiple different purposes. And so we've kind of have to understand when a protocol at the center of all of that is involved, um, we've got to make sure that we can account for any of the gaps that, that have, to, uh, you know, have to be taken up um, when we're trying to map our applications across all of those different cloud infrastructures. So some of the high level hard things that we have to consider that we don't normally see in a lot of areas uh, within, within our networks. Um, cloud can be quite complex. Everything is based upon IP. So when you've got a uh, centricity around IP, um, you've got to take into account things that you probably didn't in your traditional L2, L3 uh, types of, of gap analysis that you did maybe several years ago in IPv6, uh, you know, in that deployment. Um, we have API endpoints, right? Because one of the cardinal kind of core fundamental aspects of cloud is that we have self-service provisioning, we have elasticity, um, and we have uh, a level of API-driven functionality. Um, so when APIs are involved in every part of a cloud stack, and IPv6 is what those APIs uh, are connected to, um, then we've got to have some pretty robust support around that. Uh, provisioning, orchestration, and management are critical aspects of any cloud deployment. Um, we don't do a lot of things by hand. We do a lot of things based upon uh, continuous integration, continuous deployment, dev, uh, you know, DevOps types of, of life cycles. Um, and we need to make sure that we can configure those same aspects um, from an IPv6 perspective. A uh, bunch of things on, on this slide, but a, a couple of other highlights around them is that as we kind of figure out what type of cloud we're using and what type of, uh, of product set we're using in that cloud, um, we may come across the, the ideal that either we are consumers of the cloud and someone else owns and operates it, or if we are the actual creator and owner of that cloud, then we have certain responsibilities to the consumers of that cloud. And so what we tend to, to see in one of those bullet points is that we forgo the control plane aspects of our cloud and we say, I'm just going to provide the tenant facing users of my cloud with IPv6. Um, this is without a doubt the uh, large percentile of how people deploy their clouds with IPv6 today is they are kind of letting the, the core fundamental control plane of the cloud, uh, the databases, et cetera, that a tenant does not see, uh, they're leaving to IPv4 and they are putting the tenant facing side on IPv6. And when we look at that kind of decision matrix that a customer goes through, um, we have kind of two common approaches that we can use in the building of our cloud. Um, we have this concept called dual stack everything, and we have another one called conditional dual stack. So when you kind of graphically take a look at a common uh, framework of, a, of, a, of what makes up a cloud, we have this thing on the left called the service tier or the control plane. Um, a lot of people will make a decision in a greenfield environment to, to dual stack that cloud. Um, and, and if they can do it, they do it. Uh, but many people are using uh, a brownfield type of implementation, something that V6 came as an afterthought to their cloud deployment. Um, and they are not prepared to go and retrofit API endpoints, databases, uh, listeners as far as uh, load balancers in front of the APIs are concerned, and so forth. And so they tend to gravitate more towards what I call the conditional dual stack, 
where the service tier itself is still IPv4, but the things that an actual tenant would interact with for their applications would consume either a dual stack or a v6 only implementation. So it's up to you from a gap analysis perspective to figure out, do you even have access to these components? If you are a consumer of the cloud, you do not. If you are the owner of the cloud, you absolutely do. And you need to be able to, to work through all of the different listeners and all of the different endpoints that exist within that stack um, and figure out if you actually have the capabilities of adding IPv6 to it um, or not. Most people today um, are, are kind of in this bucket where they're running v4 in their control plane, uh, they're running a dual stack or a, a, and or a v6 only implementation um, within the tenant space. And this allows the tenants to do what they need to do from a v6 perspective uh, while the cloud just keeps humming along. Now, some of the other kind of high level conditions is around IPv6 addressing options within the cloud uh, environment. So, um, we had, Tom did a great job about addressing, so we're not gonna rehash all of that stuff here. But the two common ones we're, we're seeing within the cloud space um, is one on the far left is option one. And this is pretty much the ideal approach, right? If you own the cloud, um, then you're generally going to be pulling a prefix that is going to be used throughout the cloud, right? It's a no brainer. You just, you, you run a, an address structure off of that. Um, and each tenant is pulling a slice out of that master prefix. Now, if you are in the business of serving enterprises um, as, a, uh, a, as a cloud owner, or maybe you are a private cloud owner and you're dealing with mergers and acquisitions, then you may be in this situation where they're going to want to bring their own prefix into your cloud. So technically, this is a no-brainer, not a big deal. But there are some ramifications to it as it relates to routing policies. Um, and, and there was a, an excellent uh, point the doctor made about CGN is, do you want to be associated with the neighbors you don't really know, right? Because you could be bringing in a prefix from uh, a, an enterprise hosted in your environment. If you don't control blacklisting very well, they could do very stupid things. Um, and in fact, you as the BGP policy holder for those routes uh, can actually be penalized uh, because of stupid behavior within your cloud. Um, the last point that I want to make on this uh, slide is the one on the far right. Don't be the stupid person that does this, <laughs> right? This is, this is continuing the broken IPv4 mentality we've all had to live with. And this is, I have a shiny new cloud with shiny new hexadecimal-based addressing, and what do I do? I do EULA, unique local addressing, inside my cloud, and then I have some sort of really dumb box they're actually quite smart boxes, but you're an idiot for deploying them, um, <laughs> which is doing translation and proxy in and out of that, okay? Please don't do this. There literally is no technical justification for you to go down this path. So uh, if you've got one, I'd love to uh, see in the parking lot as I'm driving rapidly past, because um, uh, I, uh, I just may turn the wheel, right? Uh, but, uh, but if you do have a justification for this, I would, I would be happy to, uh, to talk about it. So let's jump into the State of the Union. So let's talk about the big three. So um, Amazon AWS, uh, and again, when I'm referring to my cloud spiel here today, I'm not talking about PaaS or SaaS. I'm talking about mostly IaaS, where we're laying down applications in virtual machines or containers. I'm not even talking about serverless, like AWS Lambda and so forth. Um, this is mostly about getting applications into a container or into a virtual machine and doing something with it. So AWS absolutely has the strongest and was the earliest one to have uh, v6 support out there. Um, they did do some pretty dumb things early on, but uh, it, it's, it's kind of a crawl, walk, one, a run uh, model with inside of the cloud. Um, and so they've, they've got some pretty good stuff. And so, so these are some of the highlighted um, areas that you can go to. Not going to spend a lot of time in here. Um, some people uh, w have come to uh, Amazon and asked, you know, hey, can we, we get a variable length? Um, addressing out of our VPCs. No, today it's a 56 and you get a 64 per network that you assign. Um, so it's, it's pretty, uh, pretty clear cut. Um, now, if you get into some things like uh, S3 and CloudFront, there are some goofy things that you got to pay attention to in there. But for the most part, um, they got relatively uh, fairly strong support. 
Um, I've got a lot of friends at Google, so this is no ding on them, but right now, you know, they're kind of early in the build out of their GCP uh, environment, and right now there is no V6 support that is outside of alpha stage. Um, so th these are uh, some references to exactly what their, their statements are. Um, there is an alpha feature, and it is very boldly called out as an alpha feature, and they are doing what I told you not to do in that third uh, chart. Uh, <laughs> Which is, it's even worse than that, in fact. It's not a EULA to a private. It is a V4 only on the back end with a V6 uh, uh, reverse proxy on the front side. Um, so there's some pretty cool functionality there. I mean, they can do front, uh, front end SSL termination and, and a bunch of other things that, that uh, are, are pretty cool, uh, but it is really not something to be, uh, to be worked on because they specifically state, uh, do not ever uh, put a production workload in here because this could vanish at any moment. So, uh, so they're trying to get some stuff done, but uh, you know, being Google, uh, they'll probably close the gaps on this pretty quickly. Now, on Azure, uh, there's some also some pretty good stuff. So there's a list of regions. Um, I encourage you um, to really spend some time in this load balancer document. Um, get you a good stiff drink and and work through it because they are very good at documenting what some of the caveats are and, and what you can expect. Some of the high level items that I, I found to be a, a little interesting is one, you are literally doing nothing from V6 if you're not translating a load or uh, passing through uh, uh, load balancers, uh, which is doing mandatory NAT. Um, so I thought that was a little interesting and here's one of the call outs uh, uh, about that. So you cannot assign public IPv6 addressing to the virtual machines. You will always have uh, a private v6 range that they translate north and south to. And then when you are doing east-west communication between the VMs, it is over v4. So again, this is very important for your developers. This is very important for your automation frameworks, where it is expecting a very specific flow from a path perspective between one component to another component, such as an app to a database uh, relationship. If your automation is expecting a v6 communication between those two in your automation framework, um, and they are requiring you to actually traverse a, 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 tra or a, a load balancer instead of communicating directly with the host itself, that breaks the automation framework, right? So these are the types of things you need to be working through because it's very, very important on your developers know uh, the rules around this. Now, some of the open source uh, and private cloud and container stuff, there's a bunch of links that are in here. So the, uh, the big four that we're gonna talk about in here is, uh, is OpenStack. Uh, first is an open source cloud computing stack that you can use for public and private clouds. Um, and it by far has the most robust IPv6 support of any cloud, public, private, uh, closed source or open source by far. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, Docker has really uh, good support. I've spent a lot of time with the Docker guys in, in working through um, a wide variety of components, Docker Engine, Docker Swarm, uh, Compose, Registry. Uh, Hub is really your only letdown because it actually is on a non-V6 enabled uh, EC2 environment. So when you are pulling uh, images out of Docker Hub, it's still over V4. Uh, Kubernetes is, a, is a, a difficult place. Currently, there is no support for IPv6 publicly in the Kubernetes environment. Uh, I work on a team. Uh, Patrick back here uh, uh, manages that team uh, that is feverishly working on IPv6 support. So if you are into Kubernetes, and you want to contribute code uh, using Go in that environment, uh, jump on here and take a look at some of these requests that we have outstanding uh, to go and close the IPv6 gaps on Kubernetes. Uh, Apache Mesosphere, extremely limited information about it, but from the deployment stuff I know people have, um, it's, it's way behind as well uh, from a Kubernetes perspective. So this is just a, a kind of snapshot in time of, of where we are with some of these. There's also a bunch of reference material we don't have time to go into. So if you're an OpenStack person, I've written a bunch of documents uh, that kind of talk about how to deploy uh, the various features with inside of an OpenStack environment, and I've done the same thing on Docker. Uh, so my, uh, my site is debug-all, um, and uh, I've, I'll be adding Kubernetes uh, material to that uh, as well. 
So what we want to do now is not educate you on OpenStack. We want to use a cloud stack to reinforce some of the concepts that we want to make sure you walk away from uh, today. Uh, because this is not about a single machine talking to another single machine on a physical network. This is talking about orchestration of a highly complex uh, grouping of resources in such a way that they can communicate regardless of what they are over an IPv6 transport. And so we're going to leverage OpenStack because by far it is the most powerful set of features that we have on any public or private cloud uh, implementation. So we're going to leverage a little of that and walk through a demo and we're going to kind of highlight some of the big ticket items you guys need to walk out of here with uh, as it relates to design. So uh, just real quick, before we kind of jump into uh, what some of these examples are, I want to kind of let you know what OpenStack is. So first, how many people know what OpenStack is? OK, so quite a few people are here. This is why we only have one slide on this. Uh, <laughs> OpenStack is um, kind of scratch the freely available part because nothing in life is free, especially open source software, right? Um, you're going to pay the price somewhere, and it's going to be a painful one. Uh, but as it relates to downloading the software, that part is actually free. Um, it is completely open source and it is completely API driven. This is incredibly important for you when you start to deploy a cloud that is top to bottom API driven versus uh, basically wedging yourself in through a software development kit that exposes only a small percentage of the overall functionality. When you have top to bottom API exposure, you can do a lot of very powerful things. You can do it through your own API calls. You can do it through your own automation framework, like a, a Terraform or a, a Chef or an Ansible. Um, or you can call it directly from a, a Python environment or you know whatever it is that your language of choice is. Um, with that power, though, as they say, comes great responsibility. Because if you want to use the entire stack, then you have to understand the entire stack. Um, and from an open stack perspective, that means potentially years of your life lost and complete loss of your hair. Um, because uh, if, uh, if V6 didn't kill me, open stack absolutely will. So from a high level of OpenStack support, uh, we have literally everything you can pull from, from Slack to stateless and stateful DHCP and IPv6 prefix delegation. Um, we have, uh, depending on which distro you pull from and depending on which components you assemble from an OpenStack perspective, nearly all of the control plane components are also available from an IPv6 implementation. Um, that is primarily in a dual stack environment. I'm actually not aware of anyone that has done a V6 only control plane deployment of OpenStack. Um, if you have, I'd love to, to know exactly what components you glued together for that. But there is definitely some legacy um, things that you've got to have in place from a V4 perspective to get that running. Um, orchestration uh, is a very powerful aspect within OpenStack. So everything within OpenStack is built upon what we call projects. Um, and one of the projects is called Heat. And we're going to walk through what Heat is doing for us from a V6 perspective. Uh, but it allows us to, within our stack, deploy a bunch of components that talk to one another to build a stack. Um, and so we have V6 only and dual stack support. In our, in our example today, we'll be building uh, a V6 only tenant with some V6 applications, uh, running containers, et cetera. And we'll kind of walk through what you need to think about from a cloud perspective. Uh, we got security groups, which are like ACLs. Uh, load balancing as a service um, kind of has had a bumpy uh, movement uh, throughout the OpenStack environment on basically what tools you want to use. Uh, but uh, there's, there's some pretty robust support for V6 inside of, of LVAS. So let's jump over here to our demo um, and uh, kind of walk through that. So you guys see the font size OK in the back there? All right. So one of the things that we're going to talk about is when we're in cloud, unlike many other places we are within, within IT or within technology area, um, we generally don't want to build a cloud by hand, and we don't want to operate a cloud by hand. Um, so orchestration and automation are very, very powerful things. So one of the things that we're going to look at here is this YAML file. Um, is a file that we use inside of, of OpenStack. If you are using AWS, for example, you would run CloudFormation um, or your own automation frameworks, whatever you're, you're using. But you're basically creating a template of what you want to be manifest inside of your cloud. Um, inside of OpenStack, we use um, uh, Heat for this. 
and we've got kind of a, a parameter section that basically uh, tells me what I need to set. Um, in this example, we can see here that we're going to build a private network and a private subnet that's IPv6, and we're going to set a gateway. Um, and we can dynamically inject these variables. We can set a starting ending range for DHCP. Um, and then we have a resources section, and this is basically where we begin to glue things together. Um, so like I mentioned, uh, OpenStack uh, has the ability to do Slack, stateful, stateless DHCP, and prefix delegation, so we can set what type of uh, addressing range we want. Um, we want a router so that we can route, um, and we can associate that with the subnets. Um, and we can also do uh, interesting things inside of our virtual machines, containers, or servers. So why I call this particular area out is because this is very important for you to understand what your cloud looks like in a v6 only world. Uh, many, many clouds will not allow you to purely build a v6 only network with a v6 only virtual machine and hope for it to build, boot, and do all of the things like DNS, etc. that you need. Um, so we'll talk about that. One of the very last slides is kind of some of the high level conditions you need to think about in cloud around IPv6 only. But in the context of OpenStack, we are bound within the OpenStack framework to use the metadata service. Amazon owns the metadata service. They do not allow other people to write to the Amazon metadata service. So that means that if you want to enable IPv6 in it, they won't let you. I'll actually show you a pull request we have with Amazon that's, I think, four years old, and we still can't get them to enable IPv6 inside of the metadata service. So when we do v6 only in the cloud, we have to realize that we may be dependent upon someone else's technology that is hindering us from actually doing v6 only. So one of the areas that we tend to work around that in OpenStack, AWS, et cetera, um, is we inject information into the virtual machine at the time it's booted to work around the fact that their metadata service is screwing us, right? Um, if the machine comes up and is expecting the metadata service to inject my domain name information or some other parameter, um, but yet I can't reach the metadata service because it's v4 only, then I have to do something else. And so we uh, tend to inject the information in what we call cloud config drive or cloud config or cloud init depending on the naming of uh, your particular provider is using. Um, also, we have the, the capabilities in all of these areas to, to run you know, access control groups, um, load balancers, uh, associating a listener for a load balancer uh, that we have here, and so forth. Okay, So this is kind of an example of what you would be using in the cloud and how you would be doing that from an IPv6 perspective. So this is, uh, this is basically that template is, is being operated. Uh, I basically ran a single command to go and deploy everything that's in that resource file, and now it's manifested itself inside of this uh, environment. So part of that environment, of course it timed out, if, if you guess it, you get the rest of the free lunch. I'm a giver. So, so as a part of, you, if you recall, one of the aspects of our heat template is that we're creating a private network. If you are running um, Azure or you're running uh, AWS today, this could be a public or private network that you're identifying inside of your VPC. Um, this, in this particular case, it is a private network um, that is being routed, not translated, but routed to the outside world. We do not do v6 translation inside of OpenStack, uh, unlike uh, some of the, the uh, public cloud providers would do. But we can see here, we've got a private um, IPv6 environment, which has happened to be running at a, a, you know, a routable space in the context of this demo. And we've got simultaneously a dual stack network that's going on uh, in there as well. Um, we also, as a part of our orchestration environment, we said we want to front end our application through load balancers. So uh, when you're looking at VPC uh, with, with uh, the elastic load balancer, whether you're in classic mode or you're running the ALB in the new mode um, or you're in Azure, then you have the same functionality. The difference we have here, though, is that in a lot of the, the cloud environments, they are heavily relying on that load balancer being the intermediary between the things that are inside of your private or your VPC environment and what gets reached to the outside world. Um, things like OpenStack, we can conditionally say, 
Well, you've got a load balancer or you don't, and we don't bound you to require that from a V6 perspective. Um, so you need to, again, uh, think through how your application is going to be deployed in the cloud in such a way that you know when automation gets turned on or your staff needs to go and take an application that's existing on-prem and now move it into a public cloud environment that you are thinking through how that cloud provider is forcing traffic flow. Okay, because I promise you, it's likely not the same way you're doing it in your vSphere or your Hyper-V or your Zen or whatever environment you have on-prem. When you move that to the public side, um, the actual flow of that framework may be different, okay? So um, our, our automation has, has pulled an address. It's, uh, it's pulled this particular um, address out of that range, which is, uh, which is our load balancer. We can come up here. Um, we can see that address has popped up in here. And if uh, all works well, right, it's amazing. It's a demo page, right? This is just one notch better than a ping demo, right? Um, <laughs> But, but this is basically what you're hoping for, right? Is that you either have a hybrid cloud environment, for example, where you've got your front end is at Azure or is sitting in a VPC somewhere, but for compliance reasons um, or locality reasons or DR reasons, you've got your database and all of your monitoring and analytics stuff is back at your home base on-prem within a data center and you have linkage between the two. Um, you want to be able to have traffic flow to a front end, which then flows to the back end, uh, whether all of that is lo loca you know, from a location perspective on-prem or you've got it geographically stretched, the same framework exists. You have to understand the traffic flow. You have to understand the automation tool that your operations and development teams are using, and then you have to stitch those things together. So from a cloud perspective and IPv6 perspective, know how the apps work on the cloud in which you've selected, okay? So this is just one example of what we have here. Now, the other part of this is, goes back to that uh, situation I was talking about is, you are at an extreme disadvantage if you are a consumer of a cloud versus the provider of the cloud. If you're the provider of the cloud, you do what you damn well please pretty much, right? Uh, within compliance uh, frameworks. Um, but you also uh, are kind of uh, bound under the wishes of what your particular uh, tenants or, or projects or application users are going to, to, to look at, right? So this goes back to that earlier slide around how much V6 do you enable in your environment, right? In this particular case, I can actually, um, in this particular case, I can actually get to an IPv6 enabled uh, Docker image that's running inside of my cloud over V6. So this is a dual stacked cloud on the control plane and on the tenant side. Uh, you may be in a situation where your entire control plane is v4 only, but the tenants are v6 enabled. And if that's the case, then you have to understand how do you allow access into those particular tenant applications. It's easy in an AWS or an Azure environment, right? We publish uh, you know, these routable addresses. We give you a key, you download the key, and you go in, and, that, and that's the way it goes. But if you're in an enterprise type of environment, that may radically be different because you may not be exposing uh, an address structure or security group structures that are not in a port range that are mapped to the application that's sitting inside of that tenant. So do you allow them to come in on v4, but the rest of the world consumes the app on v6? Or do you dual stack it or v6 only it enough uh, that you provide both the control plane access uh, as well as the application access? So in this particular case, um, we're, we're going to uh, connect in through um, a namespace or a VRF uh, to connect into this machine. And um, this will be one of the, the nodes that we have here that is a part of our load balancing pool. So the last thing that I want to talk about here before we, we kind of move to the V6 only uh, part and, and take questions is that based upon the target image you're running and based upon whether you're dual stacking versus V6 only, um, you may have to do unnatural things to your images. Uh, so one example here is if we take a look at the way I have configured the properties for this particular virtual machine, we can see here that I've got this cloud config setting a fully qualified uh, uh, domain name of this, this one line. 
If I did not have this in, in a V6 only environment, what would the virtual machine name of this be? If you raise your hand and you know OpenStack, you'll know it's predicated on talking to the metadata service for its name. In a v6 only environment, the metadata service is unavailable to us because it's v4 only. So little things like what is the freaking name of the virtual machine gets broken, <laughs> right? My domain name, cisco.com. My DNS server, 2001 blah, 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 right? All of those things break. So you have got to find a way in a v6 only environment of injecting somehow this information. The common ways that people do this is, the first one is, they bake their images with everything they need in the image. So I'm going to run a, a RHEL 7 image or a Windows Server image or whatever it is. I set those unique metadata properties in the image, save them as a snapshot, boot from the snapshot, right? Have a nice day, pretty simple to do. It's very limiting though, right? Because now it's, I have to go into every one of the images and change or I have to retrofit the snapshots and that screws all of the uh, resting images uh, that it's based on. Um, or I can run something like cloud config or config drive or what cloud init, whatever your tool set is, and actually inject this information at the time it boots. Um, so that's, that's the second uh, predominant uh, way of doing that. And that's basically how I'm setting that, is I'm using a user data field. It's very similar to what uh, AWS uh, sets. And I'm just setting this one value, and I can set a shit ton of values in here, right? I'm just using one to, to, to kind of illustrate uh, the point of, of, of what we're doing here, all right? So from the IPv6 only perspective, we talked a lot about that this week. And this is very important because you need to do a lot of, of testing around uh, all of the intricate components. I've just very briefly mentioned a few things that will go south on you depending on what your cloud provider is. But from an OpenStack perspective uh, and from things like um, Docker Engine in the, in the latest release, not the, the Swarm or or a Kubernetes-driven uh, Docker environment, um, you can be fairly successful with an IPv6-only uh, environment if you understand this part, right, where uh, the things that we rely on to inject, our domain names, our keys, all of those things that we do uh, rely on a metadata service that is v4-only. So we got to kind of circumvent that through other tools. Um, we also need some help, right? If you are an AWS customer, for example, um, you should be yelling and screaming at them about the metadata service. Um, we, we've had great discussions with them, uh, but they're just, they just aren't moving on this particular thing. Uh, so there's a, a, a wish list bug that's got a long path of how do we do things with the AWS service specifically inside of, of OpenStack. Uh, but, uh, but this is definitely an area that, that if you are an AWS customer, it'd be great to have some ammunition to go and, and work on that stuff. So the, the summary of those two items is, uh, from a workaround perspective, build what you need inside your image, um, and then screw the metadata service. You don't, you don't need to rely on it. Or use as an external injection mechanism, such as cloud init, config drive, something like that, uh, to actually inject the parameters inside of your images that you need. Um, this is kind of a high level view of, of what some of that looks like. And, and again, I've got about 35 more slides in here that you guys will have access that walks you through nauseating CLI um, on a lot of these parameters. So when you download the PDF, there'll be a lot more detail in here that will kind of help you guys um, through the flow. So let's uh, wrap this up and take some questions. So IPv6 is here. Um, and if you don't have it, you're probably late, right? I think we've said this for what, 19 years or so? Um, but uh, I really mean it this time. Um, you know, traditionally, L2, L3, even up to L7 from a load balancing perspective have always been kind of the bane of our existence. Um, that's really not your concern in the, in the cloud environment. Uh, today, those things are being handled by someone else 
or if you happen to own the cloud and the infrastructure it sits on, you really have no excuse not to do V6 there. Um, we, we've got, I don't care who the vendor is, from an L2 through L7, uh, there's pretty powerful support. Yes, there's some outliers here and there, and there's some things with unified comms or some weird feature in wireless that you don't have. Uh, but for the most part, you can get done um, a lot of uh, good stuff uh, inside of your environment. The problem that you have is that, uh, and I think, I think it was uh, Veronica who said it, that people are really what can cause you problems, right? Um, and that's true because I'm antisocial and I hate you all. Um, but, <laughs> but, uh, but it really is that, right? It's just, it's just that people are difficult to uh, deal with from a technology, from a business, and from even an application flow process, right? And that kind of mentality uh, finds its way into these three areas because humans are doing them. Humans are developing the code. Humans are developing the automation frameworks for your cloud. Humans are developing the automation around and the orchestration of all of the various cloud components you have. So if they don't understand that the target in which they're developing or automating against is different than the one that they were using when it was on-prem or with another cloud provider, now you've added a new cloud provider, I promise you there's going to be disconnect. Uh, and it won't be the protocol's fault, it will be their lack of understanding and likely if you manage them, your lack of leadership that guided them down the right, right path, right? Uh, so that, that's a very important aspect to deal with. It is not hard to serve internet or internal facing clients. Um, it, that's true, uh, especially from a data plane perspective. Uh, we can serve literally anything you want from a regular L3 through L7 kind of environment. The challenge that we have in the cloud, again, is if you own or manage or operate the cloud, that decision for you to turn on V6 in the control plane is really going to be one of the biggest things you do. Um, do you absolutely have to have V6 on a database? Do you absolutely have to have V6 between an API front end and something that's listening on the back? Yes, on the northbound side of that API, you do. But the relationship between the interworking components of your cloud, maybe you don't, not today. Right, and so if that's the case, then uh, you know uh, Veronica's part of hey, we were uh, you know uh, going gangbusters on IPv6, but guess what? Other stuff came up, and that's exactly what's going to happen to you. As I promise you, there's probably more important things in your uh, plate than trying to figure out which database is going to listen on what port over IPv6 inside the internal aspects of your cloud. So that control plane support, I would not stress about. Um, but you better know what control plane parts are exposed to users and exposed to automation because it may not be a human that interacts with an API, it may be a tool that interacts with an API. And if they're trying to do a V6 or a protocol agnostic call um, and it's not there, you're gonna be in trouble. Um, IPv6 only for every cloud component is gonna be tough to consume. Uh, we got a long ways to go before every cloud and every component in it and around it uh, can be a V6 only thing. So I think that's a theme through this, this week is we really would love to do IPv6 only. It makes complete sense. But the reality of it is, is that V4 is gonna be around uh, jabbing us in the side for quite some time. The last part I wanna make here uh, around uh, building cloud native applications, et cetera, is the choice to go from protocol uh, supportive um, and protocol agnostic, right? So protocol agnostic is awesome. We can make a call and not care about the protocol. Or do you add V6 support to a V4 capable application? Um, so in the cloud native world, we tend to try to write applications that are protocol agnostic, um, where they're, they're uh, relying on something below them to make stack calls. The app uh, framework itself is not doing that. But if you have to, then you're gonna to have to add V6 alongside a V4 support inside of that protocol call. The final part here is don't be paralyzed by the perceived workload of what you have to do. So I mean, LinkedIn and many other people that I've talked about this week have went through the hard work to do, you know, product gap analysis, which sucks, right? I own uh, five different vendors products in multiple different areas of my company, and now I have to do line by line, feature by feature, protocol gap analysis of that is horrendous to do.
Okay, and many of us in this room have done it. Uh, when you tackle cloud with V6, guess what? You get to do it all over again, and you're also probably doing it on someone else's cloud uh, that you may not have full, good documented support of what those protocol calls look like or the support there is. Uh, so start simple, start small, create a VPC, create a single network, run a couple of containers or a couple of virtual machines on it and figure out what doesn't work and then just start expanding your scope from there, okay? So that's where I'm gonna end it. We got a couple minutes for questions or have has the melatonin kicked in? I see only three people asleep, so that's good. <laughs> questions? And Ed is not allowed to ask one. Um, so, uh, <laughs> yeah, I'll ask the troll question first now. Just. Uh, on the last one in regards to, um, is there anything that's going on tooling wise to make it a little easier to discover? So maybe like using Terraform or something else to be able to get better discovery around what has V6 support, what doesn't? Because there, I know Mitchell's doing a great job with V6 support and all the HashiCorp tools and I didn't know if there was something that you thought lead, led that way better. Well, so, so there's two aspects of that question. One is, does the tool do anything related to V6? And the other one is, can you use a tool to discover V6 functionality? Uh, and so the answer to that is uh, yes, no, and maybe. Um, yes, the, the tool needs to be able to understand V6 if you're going to, for example, I'm, I'm running Ansible, SSH-based, I'm going to go and run a playbook on 50 machines. Um, it's going to do that over SSH. Can it do it over V6, right? And so depending on your version, yes, no, right? Um, so that's the capability of the tool. Um, the other one is to intelligently leverage the tool to go and discover stuff is actually where the power's at. Um, so if I'm running Terraform or Salt or Chef or Puppet or Ansible or something like that, then I absolutely can create playbooks or whatever you want to call them in that framework to connect to a device to feed back to me specific information, right? So maybe I create a bogus interface and run an IPv6 address command on it. Does it work or does it pipe back to me a broken thing, right? Um, so using automation will allow you way better than we did back at circa 2002 for us to go in and field across a large network environment to figure out is V6 support for these particular items there. And so I would highly encourage automation to do that. Yeah. Any questions? So one, one of the problems that I found, I think that was your first slide, uh, you know, uh, talk to your account uh, manager. Uh, trouble that I find is that I talk to the account manager, but he doesn't know to find you. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, so that account manager needs to know how to find a person that owns a product, not a protocol, right? Uh, so, so anybody here that is in the vendor space very well knows the horrific pain of getting V6 singularity across a catalog of tens of thousands of components. Um, we used to have, uh, and many uh, teams have gotten rid of and are now reinstating kind of a V6 czar, if you will. Somebody that kind of says, thou shalt do V6 these ways across all of these things. Um, not everyone has that, and uh, even the ones that they have are terribly overburdened. Um, so it used to be fairly easy in a smaller portfolio to report, this is the state in this version, you can have these 200 features, right? Uh, the problem that we have is um, that we don't have, and I think again, to call out Veronica, many, many people don't have the information they need because they don't ask. Um, so it sucks if you go to your account team and they don't know who to get a hold of, but a lot of people don't ask at all. They go and, you know, you know, scour through 200 pages of a website that sucked to begin with and really sucks for V6. Um, and so, you know, that's unfortunate that it's that way. I think all the vendors want to do the best that they can in that space. But, um, but I mean, if there is something specific to Cisco that I can help with, email me, mcfarland at cisco.com, and I'll find someone that will disappoint you. Uh, no, no, no. <laughs> I will find someone that will talk to you, um, and we will get the, we will get that answered. But but I'm one of you know a hundred vendors anybody deals with that that you may not have direct connectivity to. So um, yeah, that's as far as I can say on that. Anything else? Anybody else? 
Hopefully not. I don't want to make anyone else mad. All right, thanks, guys. Appreciate it.